Welcome, everybody. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. It's always a celebration when we start a new book. Uh, and um, really surprisingly, uh, this is only the second time in the virtual reading group that we're reading Eichmann in Jerusalem, which is probably Arendt's most famous and and, and well-known book. Um, not to you know, some people think it's uh, not her best, but it's, I actually think it's, it's extraordinary and um, certainly uh, worth reading uh, very closely, especially uh, at a time like we're in today um, as, as questions of, of, of anti-Semitism and, and genocide and totalitarianism are in the news. Uh, and this book will deal with all of that. Uh, it's, it's one of the first books that attempts to understand philosophically and legally what genocide is um, and articulate uh, an understanding, uh, a philosophically and legally rigorous understanding of genocide that I think uh, will be quite helpful um, as we think about uh, both her attempt to understand um, Adolf Eichmann and 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 the world of 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 German Nazism, but also uh, for those of us interested in thinking about what's going on today uh, in the Middle East. So, um, uh, it's an extraordinary book. Uh, uh, it's maybe one of the most controversial uh, books ever published. It unleashed a firestorm uh, when it was published in 1963, of of both positive and negative attacks. Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I wanted to start, uh, by giving a bit of a timeline, uh, let you, uh, just give you a sense of, of some of what's going on in the background, because this is a book of, first of all, I should say it's a book of journalism. Uh, this book was originally, uh, written, uh, for the New Yorker magazine. Um, Hannah Arendt, uh, famously, uh, wrote to the New Yorker. And said, uh, you know, I I have always I never got to see people like Eichmann in the flesh because I left Germany too early. Uh, she left in 1933 after she'd been arrested and released. And so she didn't really um, confront uh, Nazi officials and Nazi bureaucrats at the height of the war. And she wrote to um, The New Yorker and said, uh, I, I will never forgive myself if I don't go to this trial and and confront um and see um a nazi in person in the flesh she wrote and um and and that desire to go and see a nazi in the flesh as she wrote uh was uh what led her to ask to be uh to cover for this story as a journalist for the new yorker and uh she was accepted and uh and she did um some of you may know that about 10 years ago uh um, Marguerite von Schrada, uh, a famous German director, directed uh, a version, uh, a movie, a biopic on Hannah Arendt, which centered around the her coverage of the trial and and the controversy around it. Uh, it it's it's not an accurate. I mean, it's not a it's not a documentary. It's it's generally a good movie. I was an advisor on it. If you do ever, you can rent it online and watch it. But if you ever buy the DVD, the DVD comes with a little a little pamphlet that um, I collaborated with them on. I only mention it because in it, there's some biography of all the people involved, but also I think a very helpful timeline um, that uh, that goes through uh, and I think is helpful because it is a work of journalism and a work of history. It's helpful to have some of these dates in, in our minds. And so I'm just gonna walk you through a few dates that I want you to um, keep in your mind as you're reading this book. First of all, um, Adolf Eichmann uh, was born on March 19th, 1906. Hannah Arendt was born on October 14th, 1906. So they were the same age. Uh, they were both um, uh, born at the same time uh, and, and grew up in Germany and Austria uh, around the same period. Uh, Arendt received her PhD in 1932, the same year Eichmann joined the Austrian Nazi party. Um, Eichmann then became uh, a member of the Reichssicherheitsamt, uh, uh, which is often called the SS, in 1934, 
And from 1934 to 38, he worked for the SS uh, in a division on intelligence about Jewish and Zionist organizations. In 1941, he was promoted to lieutenant colonel, and that's the highest position he ever got to. In section uh, 4B of the SS, uh, of the Reichssicherheit Amt, uh, for Jewish affairs. In 1942, he was the secretary at the Von C conference where the final solution was debated and decided upon. Um, in 1942 and 43, he began organizing de deportations um, of Jews to uh, death camps around uh, Eastern Europe. In 1944, in probably his most infamous um, activity, he basically was put in charge of the entire uh, deportation process in Hungary. After the war in 1946, he was caught by the United States, but they didn't know who he was and he escaped US custody. And in 1950, he fled to Argentina where he worked under an assumed name. Uh, in 1956 to 57, he engaged in a series of interviews um, with uh, a man named Sassen, uh, who had been a Dutch Nazi journalist. And we will uh, and and these interviews um, with Sassen, um, which are which were recorded and um, transcribed in part and published in 1960 in in Life magazine, parts of them, not all of them. Um, uh, have have become part of the controversy around uh, Eichmann and Arendt uh, insofar as um, uh, so, some people have argued that um, the Sassen interviews um, show that Arendt's reading of Eichmann was, uh, was misinformed or was diluted. Um, Arendt herself read all of the parts of the, the transcripts of the Eichmann Sassen interviews that had been published. Uh, so it's certainly not the case that she didn't know about them. And she even read some of the unpublished uh, material uh, that Eichmann produced uh, in conjunction with Sassen in Argentina. Um, in May 11th, 1960, the Israeli Mossad, their secret service, kidnapped Eichmann. In April 1961, they put him on trial in Jerusalem a trial that Arendt attended the first month of and the last few sessions of, the rest of which she read about through the transcripts. In May, 30, May 31st, 1962, Eichmann was hanged. And uh, about eight months later in February of 1963, Arendt's uh, five essays began appearing in the New Yorker magazine. And then in May, 1963, her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil was published. So I give you those um, facts because I just want us to know a little bit about um, the history because there's going to be a lot of history in this book. One of the one of the uh, interesting aspects of this book is you're going to if you read it uh, and you participate in this in this discussion, you're going to learn a lot about um, the way the deportations worked, uh, how, what Eichmann did. You know, and, and you're going to learn a lot of history about um, the Third Reich, whether you, well, if you want, uh, it's there. This is a historical book. Um, uh, there's a, there is an argument to it, but it's mostly history. Uh, and it's unique amongst RN's books in that, in that regard. Um, when the book came out in 1963, it unleashed what the literary critic uh, Irving Howe called a civil war amongst New York intellectuals. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith sent out a 10-page rebuttal of the book, uh, arguing that, quote, somehow only Adolf Eichmann is not etched in acid. He emerged as a vaguely sympathetic object, a victim of the system, and somewhat to be pitied. I'll ask you to keep that in mind as you read the book. Um, it's certainly uh, not how I read the book. Um, uh, and I don't think that was Arendt's intent at all, uh, but it was um, uh, a reaction that some people had. I'm not sure if they actually read the book or not. Ar Arendt thought that 
critics who could say something like that simply hadn't read the book. Um, and uh, you'll have to make your own decision and we can talk about it as we go along. Um, uh, it was also praised very highly. Uh, Robert Lowell, the poet, said that Arendt's portrait of Eichmann, far from being lenient, is a masterpiece in rendering the almost unreadably repellent. Uh, it's nice to have poets. Um, they they make us see things. Unreadably repellent. The almost unreadably repellent. I love that. Um, in any case, uh, it was it was it was a controversial book, uh, and it's worth us paying attention to that. I just wanted to. Um, give a, a little bit of, of, of introduction as background and to say that the book is largely controversial because of the subtitle, right? The subtitle is a report on the banality of evil. The words banality of evil only appear on the very last line of the book, right? And uh, on the last line on page 252 in the Penguin editions that I have, I'm hoping that's the same edition that the new Penguin edition has. It's the last line of the book before the epilogue, right? Um, she writes, uh, it was as though in those last minutes, Eichmann was summing up the lesson of this long course in human wickedness had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. The lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. Um, there's a few things I want to say before I, I start reading chapter one with you. Um, one is people have said that the banality of evil is a cliche. Um, first of all, it's important that when we think about the banality of evil, we return it to its context. It's the lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. She means something by that, right? It's not simply, uh, um, you know, the banality of evil, right? There's, there's more to it. Um, and, 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 and that's an important distinction. She says on that last page of the book before the epilogue, she says that the Israeli court finds Eichmann guilty of crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanities. They sentence Eichmann to death. And she says, even though she disagrees with their reasons for sentencing to death, she agrees with them that he should die and he should be hung. Um, she then says that in Eichmann's final moments, a couple of things happened. First, he drank a bottle of red wine. Second, he refused a meeting with a Protestant minister. Third, he declined the offer of a black hood with the words, I don't need that. He then emphasized that he was not a Christian and did not believe in an afterlife. And then he announced in his final words, after a short while, gentlemen, we shall meet again. Now, here is a man who just said, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in an afterlife. And he says, we shall all meet again. It's this retreat, retreat into formulaic. We shall all meet again into cliche. A basic thoughtfulness, a superficiality to say, well, I don't believe in an afterlife, but we all should meet again in the afterlife. She says that this was a man who, who simply was, was, was shallow. And he, he would speak in cliches and and we will have occasion to look at the cliches that um, govern Eichmann's brain um, throughout the next few months of reading this book together. But it was this cliche, this retreat into officialese, into bureaucraties that um, in which Eichmann could say things like he had no hatred for the Jews or that um, when they asked him, well, if he had no hatred for the Jews, how could he participate in genocide? And he said, nothing's as hot as when you eat it as when it's being cooked. Again, a cliche. Um, he insisted that his wish was to find a, a, a political solution to the Jewish problem, not a physical solution. He said he was a Zionist. All of these things 
Arendt says are cliches or empty talk. And um, this, she says, these cliches performed a role for him. They were in a sense safeguards against reality. They prevented him from, 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 from actually confronting the reality of what he was doing. And it was in this context, right? That she says, it was as though in those last minutes, Eichmann was summing up the whole lesson of his life and of this trial. The lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. It's a kind of shallowness and banality that is so caught up in cliches that it can't actually address reality. It's word and thought defying. And, and and that's what we're going to have to try and understand as as we read this book um, and 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 understand her argument, which is never that Eichmann is not evil. Right. Uh, she, she thinks he should be hung. It's that. Eichmann um, uh, was the embodiment of a particular kind of evil in the modern world. That evil in the modern world was more likely to be done by banal, thoughtless, cliche, hampered people than by monsters. And, and that's sort of the insight here. And um, uh, I don't think that's a cliche. We can agree with it or we can disagree with it. First, we got to have to understand it. And that's what the book is about. Um. Chapter one of the book, uh, which is fairly short, is called The House of Justice. And um, a few things I just want to emphasize uh, in this short introductory um, uh, chapter. Uh, one is the idea of justice. Arendt frames the book in the first chapter along the question of, how to do justice or what is justice. And that is going to be a leading question throughout the book. Uh, she, she says that there are two um, embodiments of different understandings of justice at the trial. Um, one is judge Moshe Landau, uh, who is um, uh, a, 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 a German Jew uh, and is the chief judge of the proceedings. She says of him, um, that he was proof, if proof were still needed, of 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 the kind of of his independence and of his commitment to justice um, beyond any kind of political uh, other reasons for the trial. Um, whereas uh, Gideon Hausner, who was the chief prosecutor, she said serves not justice, but David Ben Gurion, the the president of Israel. Um, the Prime Minister of Israel. Um, she 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 finds that Hausner, over the course of the trial, is not going to focus on the question of justice. What is the question of justice? The question of justice is: Is Adolf Eichmann guilty of the crimes of which he's charged? Uh, she says, in a in, in justice, we actually have a hero. We have a main character the defendant. And the question is, did they do it? It's a very uh, simple question. You know, in uh, if you are, if you go to law school, you learn that in any crime, there are two parts. There's the uh, actus reus and the mens rea. The actus reus is the guilty act and the mens rea is the guilty intent. And traditionally in Western criminal law, uh, to be guilty, you need both. You need to have both done a guilty act and done it with a guilty mind or a guilty intent. Um, and she says that's what justice uh, would seem to require. Um, she's going to, at the end of the book, she's going to deviate from that to some degree. And she's going to offer another idea of justice um, that she thinks uh, um, the trial revealed. Uh, and that's going to be uh, important. Um, but for now, she's taking the traditional view that justice is about, um, did the defendant do it? And what she says is that um, 
the judge, Moshe Landau, there's three judges, but he's the he's the main judge, tried to keep the trial concerned with justice. And the um the 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 prosecutor, the attorney general, Hausner, um, kept wanting to make the trial about other things. Um what other things? Well, there were a number. Uh, he wanted the he wanted to, it was an educational moment, especially. Um, people saw it as an educational moment for younger Israelis who had been born uh, since the war, right? This is happening uh, 18 years after the war um, ended. And uh, they want to they wanna use it as a way to, to teach them about what happened. Uh, and RN says, you know, that's interesting, but it's not what justice is about. Um, and, um, and so a lot of the trial gets caught up in this question of telling the story of the Holocaust, uh, but not having much to do with Eichmann and the sort of the, the example of this that most, most bothers her is when they tried to, uh, uh, introduce, um, the, uh, the, uh, I think 37 volumes of, of, of somebody's, uh, reports on the, uh, general government of Poland during the war, and uh, Eichmann's name was not mentioned once in those thirty-seven volumes. And she's like, "This was just an, an example of of what was going on uh, in in trying to tell a story that had not to do with the idea of doing justice to the defendant." I should say that um, many of Arendt's critics, especially her more recent critics, um, uh, Deborah Lipstadt uh, among them. Uh, you know, have have made a, a a very strong argument that um it was wrong of Arendt uh to 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 focus on justice that Israel was a young country this was a chance to teach its own citizens and the world about what happened and it and the trial had more uh to do with that with the educational aspects than with justice. It's a it's 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 certainly a rational argument, right? What argue what Arendt is arguing is that after just having witnessed the show trials by Stalin, right, in which the legal system is perverted away from justice to to make political uh, points to educate their public, um, what. Hausner was trying to do was a show trial. It was trying to use justice uh, to make political uh, gains. And she says that's not what justice and the legal system should be about. And, um, you know, I think as we now see the legal system being politicized in our own country, in the United States, uh, and certain people trying to say that the Justice Department and the Attorney General and the FBI should be politicized, right? Um, Arendt's view could either be seen as naive or important, depending on your, your, your analysis of the situation. But for Arendt, justice demands that the accused be prosecuted. Justice insists on the importance of Adolf Eichmann. That's why she's going to spend a lot of time trying to understand Adolf Eichmann, which is why people would say, oh, he comes across as sympathetic. I don't think it's sympathetic at all, but she tries to understand him. And she says, justice demands seclusion on page six. So she has a very um, demanding sense of justice, which she thinks itself is demanding. Um, there are a number of issues uh, that come up in, in the chapter uh, one is the question of um, an international court versus a Jewish court. So remember that the Nuremberg tribunals had happened after the war and they were an international court. This was an Israeli national court trying uh, a German citizen, um, uh, Adolf Eichmann. Um, she's, she also, I think, shows her incredible independence of all party partisanship uh, which is not to say she's objective, right? She's never objective, but she does try to be impartial. The difference being that uh, she doesn't claim that she has an objective truth, but she tries to at least listen to and understand all sides. That's impartiality. Um, she, she, she criticizes Israel a lot in these first few pages 
um, saying that the marriage laws, for example, and the family law in Israel, uh, which doesn't allow uh, non-Jews to marry Jews and um, treats Arabs as second-class citizens in some ways, uh, were, you know, are 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 hard to take when Hausner is going on and on about denouncing the Nuremberg laws from 1935, which said many of the same things in Germany. Um, so she's critical of Israel. Um, she's not critical of Israel's right to exist, and she's not critical of Israel's right to hold the trial. She's also deeply critical of um, uh, the Arabs, uh, and she she talks about how it was obvious to everyone what the Arabs wanted, which was to get rid of the Jews. And she's also uh, critical of the Germans, uh, and she speaks a lot about um, uh, that one of the main lessons of of the trial uh, was that as soon as Israel uh, kidnapped and put Eichmann on trial, finally, after 20 years of doing nothing, um, German prosecutors started prosecuting some German Nazis, most of whom had been using their names and had admitted what they'd done and had been living in German society because most people didn't care. They'd had no felt, felt no need to hide it, she says on page 15. And she says a few things about them. One is that the sentences that they got in these new trials were fantastically lenient, often like one or two years or sometimes just probation. And, and two, that the reason that these people felt that they could live in public and admit what they did and not change their names um, was because the German public, um, for the most part, uh, felt implicated in what they had done. And 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 she's quite um, critical of of that. She thinks that most Germans did know what was going on and chose to do nothing about it. Um, uh, she's she she talks about uh, um, this question of resistance. Gideon Hausner, the the prosecutor, a number of times asks Jews who he's interviewing as witnesses, "Why didn't you resist? Why didn't people resist?" On page eleven. The funny thing about this is that in many of the criticisms of the book, people say Arendt kept asking, why didn't Jews resist? It wasn't she who asked it. It was Hausner. And when she says this was a dumb question, and she'll say it again later, she says when Jews did resist, they were killed. And when they did resist, um, not only were they killed, but many more Jews were tortured in, in horrific ways. Um, and so she says, uh, you know, it's fairly obvious why they didn't resist and no other group resisted. So why should you expect the Jews to, ex to resist? She's called it a cruel and silly question on page 12. Um, overall, uh, you know, her critique of Hausner is that he's putting anti-Semitism on trial and he's putting the entire system of Nazism on trial, but he's often not focused on Adolf Eichmann and what he did. Um, that's, uh, I think the, the sort of structure of this opening first page, first chapter. And she's trying to say, we're going to focus on the question of justice and thus we're going to actually pay attention to Eichmann and we're going to try and figure out who Eichmann was and what did he actually do? And that's why there's going to be so much history in the middle of this book. Uh, I mean, you're going to read a lot about you know, what Eichmann was doing day to day in Hungary and other places as he's trying to deport Jews. Um, and, and so she's really going to do um, the prosecutorial work in a sense that she thinks uh, wasn't done enough of at the trial because um, uh, Hausner was focused on not Eichmann, but anti-Semitism. All right, I'll stop there and uh, remind us that there's many ways for you to engage in this conversation. One is through uh, the chat, uh, please, in the chat and also in the conversation, be willing to say to people that they're wrong or that Arendt's wrong uh, or that Arendt's right, but do it civilly, uh, you know, uh, disagree about the ideas, don't um, uh, attack the person, basic rule against ad hominem attacks in our group. Uh, and if you'd like to join the conversation, go down to reaction button and click raise hand and we will enjoy the conversation together. I look forward to it. Uh, Hannah, you're up first. 
You got to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay. okay. So this is the third time I've read Eichmann in Jerusalem. I think the first time I might have been 15. Second time was a couple of years ago before studying with you. And it's like a new book reading it the third time. It's really incredible um, that it's like a brand new book. Um, but what I was so shocked by this time that I hadn't picked up on so much last time when I was an adult was at the very beginning, um, the, the, the contempt was very, there was a tone of contempt that was very strong relating to Ben-Gurion and to uh, Hausner and, uh, and 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 it fell off. Um, you know, I think it's just an incredible book. I think it's just a genius book on so many levels. But the initial contempt is very, very strong for uh, Ben Gurion's wish. You know, I think he for his wish to to herald Zionism. Um, uh, that 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 was really a, a, a huge goal for him. You know, that the Jews were led like sheep to the slaughter, which is a really insulting uh, idea. And um, so, we, you know, and the other thing I wanted to say is the whole notion of Hasbara, I think plays a huge role in the reception of Eichmann in Jerusalem. And, um, you Can know- Can you tell me what Hasbara is? I apologize, I don't know that. Oh, it's huge because what it is, is it's the PR, it's the story that, that the diaspora gets about the Israeli story. It's the story of Israel's existence, but it's like, it has a, it, it, it's the Leon Uris, it's not Leon Uris, it's not Exodus, although that's the, that's at the far worst can pull of it. It's, it's, the rom not ro it's romanticized and real, but it's PR essentially for the state of Israel for Zionism, um, without the blemishes, without um, things that 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 went on. So we know that that Arendt was did not approve of Israel becoming a state. She wanted a commonwealth. She wanted some kind of an arrangement. And as time goes on more and more, one wonders, you know, God, what if what if they had done that? Um, you know, how much better off we could have been. Um, but so Hasbara is it, it, it is what we live with in the diaspora and what we know about and you know. Uh, you know, a lot of anti-Zionists or a lot of people now are saying that that Zionism is the American religion, you know, a Jews religion. It's their identity. It's not the it's not the the the, the religion itself. It's, you know, it's identification with Israel and it's whatever. Anyway, you know, and I had, of course, and I'm sure many other Jewish people growing up and um uh, thought that Ben Gurion is a great, 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 great man. Of course, I still do, but the shocking things that I have heard him say and uh, um, and certain things uh, were not part of public discourse. And she immediately delves into some of that, and 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 that I think so. That initial tone, that anger, comes off most strongly, I think, in the very beginning. Um, and I want and and. and so I just wondered, you know, if you kind of agree, because as I say, I think it's utter genius that she could know so much, you know, that she knew about the Mufti, that she knew in his hatred, that she knew everything. It was like at, a, at the repertorial level, it's genius at every level, it's genius. But the tone at the very beginning, I think is very striking. So thanks, Hannah. Um, uh... I think that's really a helpful first comment because I loved what you said, how even though this is the third time you're reading it, it's a brand new book. Well, that's because of you, Roger. Well, I, well, I, I appreciate that. But I want to I want to I want to broaden it a little bit, which is that you know, any book. I mean, Nietzsche once said that you can never read any book until you've read it three times. 
and I generally agree with Nietzsche on that. Um, but uh, more than that, this is a book that none of us today come to with a blank slate, right? I mean, everyone knows this is one of those most controversial books in history when they start reading it. You can't avoid it. It still is. And so um, it, it was hard enough to read it on its own in 1963. It's even harder today. And I think it may take a couple times of reading it um, to really free yourself from all the different things you're supposed to think about it so that you can read the book on its own. And, 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 and I'm, you know, by taking it slowly, we're going to read this chapter by chapter. You're going to have a chance to actually read the book and not tell, be told what you're supposed to think about it. And I just thought, I just want to say, just starting with that is really helpful. Um, it is a brand new book and, you know, I'm not going to say everything in it is, is right. Um, there are going to be mistakes. There's, there are some mistakes. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about them when we come to them. Um, uh, you don't have to agree with everything in it, but it is a brilliant book. Uh, Can I ask you one question? So I read this one, which was my dad's, and it's every page is hideously underlined. Never, but it's from 19, it's the very first edition. Is mm -hmm. the one I'm reading different? Does so, yeah. I have the first edition. I, have, I, I got the Penguin uh, Kindle yeah, because the you Peng told us to. The, the, the problem with the first edition um, is that it, it ends with the epilogue, right? And right. in the Penguin edition that we're using uh, today, the epilogue is followed by a postscript, which- The postscript she in my thing is at, the, is at the end. The postscript is at the end. It says postscript. That's okay, the last- so that, if you have, That's not the first edition then. I don't. Oh. The, the first edition ends with the epilogue. Um, I'm so, sorry. Well, it says 1963. Okay. Oh, well, maybe it is. Uh, but this works. For example, this one doesn't have the postscript in it; just the epilogue. Okay. Um, and that's the difference. So that's oh, why okay. you want to read the one. You want to read one that has the postscript in it, or you can read one without it. And then when we get to the postscript, you'll read the postscript. But this um, isn't revised in in line by line. The the Penguin edition I'm reading now. It's not. Not that I know of. Um, if someone knows of, I mean, she may have made some errata, you know, changes if there were mistakes or whatever, but I don't believe it's revised. Uh, a couple things to know. You can also read another version of it, which was the version published in The New Yorker. You can, if you're a subscriber to The New Yorker, you can read it. That is revised in the book because it's it's changed and it's reordered to make it look like a book instead of five separate articles. So it's it's also worth reading the, the, the New Yorker version. Um, which in a way is the original version. Right. Um, the contempt for, for Ben Gurion, you know, I, all I'll say is, uh, yes. Um, I mean, our, our, uh, really did not like Ben Gurion. Um, uh, and, and she found Hausner to be, um, truly awful. And, uh, and, and she says so, and it, it'll come up again throughout the rest of the book. She, she thought Hausner used every, uh, every attempt he he could to turn the trial into a show trial. And she thinks he did that to some degree on the orders of Ben-Gurion. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. That's what she says. And I have no reason to believe it's not true, but I don't know. Um, but I read, his, I read his book on the trial and I, it was interesting because I thought he it, his book was very interesting too. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and so... So he, uh, you know, she does not like him, and right. and, uh, and and so that's true. You know, uh, she she's not. You said she was not against. She was not for the state of Israel. Well, she was for Israel as a state, um, but not as a nation state. As a nation state, right? And right. um, and and she is critical of Israel, uh, insofar as it is a multi ethnic state that is insisting that it be a Jewish state which means that certain people are going to have to be second class citizens. Obviously this is a problem that over the next 70 years she's at least been right about that it was going to be a problem. We can sure we can was. leave everything else off the table for now. Um but I think she was prophetic about that. Um so anyway, 
Let's thank, uh, you. thank you. Uh Max Max Mac Mackin. Yes. Yep. Welcome. I don't know if I've met you before. Nice to meet you. I've been in a few times and thank you for putting this together. Yep. I've put a quote into the uh, chat and this is from the very start and it's about justice. Uh -huh. justice, yeah. justice demands that the accused be prosecuted, defended and judged, and that all the other questions of seemingly greater import of how, of how could it happen and why did it happen, of why the Jews and why the Germans, of what was the role of other nations and what was the extent of co-responsibility on the side of the Allies? Of how could the Jews, through their own leaders, cooperate in their own destruction? And why did they go to their death like lambs to the slaughter, be left in abeyance? On trial are, and then she goes on to talk about Eichmann, on trial are his deeds, not the suffering of the Jews, nor the German people or mankind, not even anti-Semitism and racism. And then she goes on again after Bangurian. Justice does not permit anything of the sort. It demands seclusion. It permits sorrow rather than anger. And it prescribes the most careful abstention from all the nice pleasures of putting oneself in the limelight. Um, why, for Anna Arendt, cannot justice allow these questions to be included? And, and how does Anna Arendt develop her concept of justice? Yeah, that's a great, thank you, Max. It's a great question. Thank you. So um, I, I, I said a little bit earlier, right, that Hannah Arendt, at least at this point in the book, and it's going to change a little bit later, but at least at this point in the book, is starting off with what we would call the conventional Western idea of justice, right? And the conventional Western idea of justice is that, um, in a in a criminal in a criminal law context, um, you are found guilty when you have a, a guilty act, you've done a guilty act, and you have a guilty mind. It's a moral. The idea is that you can't just punish people who do things that you think are wrong if they didn't intend them, because that's accidental. Part of um, the, the very idea of a crime is that what you're punishing is the, is the ill will. The, so in fact, the, the very idea of law in German is recht or straight, richtig, right? You're punishing the bent will. Um, you're punishing the, the evil will. Um, and so without an intent, um, that then the person who did the crime is not morally wrong and is not a criminal. You may want to find them and deter them from doing those acts in the per in, in the future. But in criminal law, you need actual intent and a certain level of intent. Um, and so she her idea of justice, right, is that that uh, you need you need that. And if you're going to then do justice. You can't just find people guilty who didn't have the intent. I mean, part of the, you know, we just read the origins of totalitarianism in this group, right? And part of uh, her, 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 her point about totalitarianism is you're putting people in jail or in camps and arresting them, um, not because they did anything wrong, but because they're Jewish or because they're gay or because they're, you know, part of a group. And what she's saying is we believe in individual justice in the West, from Plato through Hegel, that you're only guilty if you have done something wrong and you had the guilty mind to do it. If not, you know, you maybe need you maybe need to, to be deterred. You maybe need to pay a fine. Uh, maybe we should talk to you or, I mean, heaven forbid, re-educate you. I mean, she would not say that. But we need to address the problem of your behavior, but you're not a criminal. If you're actually a criminal, you have to have meant it. And and so she's saying that um, when you start talking about stopping anti-Semitism, well, I mean, think about how many people we could kill if we wanted to stop anti-Semitism. There are a lot. Uh, if you wanted to stop, um, uh, you know, uh, 
killing of civilians. There are a lot of people who we could find guilty, not because they, you know, intended to, but because they're part of a system that's killing civilians um, or putting people in cages or whatever it is. And so she says, justice actually demands you take the person seriously and ask, did they do it? And did they have some knowledge and intent to do it? Um, and and she says that's a that's an important moral foundation for our legal system. Is that answering your question or not? I mean, it is. It's giving me more questions. So, if a ran, if 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 a rent or or let's say, for instance, in the courts in this case, came to the conclusion that Eichmann had no intention, but was part of the structure and group that did it, um, he. It just doesn't seem to fit right with me in that sense. Oh, so this is actually going to be the problem. You know, when I told you she she revises this at the end, this is going to be the problem she confronts, right. which is that the the court, the trial court run by Judge Landau, who she has such enormous respect for, in the end finds that you couldn't actually find any evidence that Eichmann had killed anybody mm. and you couldn't find any evidence of him you know telling people to kill anybody right. um and so what it finds is it says that when he was if you looked at our if you looked at the Israeli criminal code he's not guilty of the only crime that they could find that he was guilty of in the Israeli criminal code was the crime of aiding and abetting murder by helping deport people to where they were going to be murdered. And um, and so they say, well, okay, that's what he's guilty of. But even though aiding and abetting is not usually thought of as the worst crime, in genocide, aiding and abetting okay. is actually an essential part of genocide and therefore it gets the death penalty. Arendt is going to say, there's something seriously wrong with the court's interpretation here. And she says, if you really think the crime he's guilty of is aiding and abetting murder, you've missed what's going on in the Holocaust. There's got to be something more to it. And so she's going to um, argue that we need to uh, we need to move beyond the actual legalistic. What crime did he do and and get to something else? And 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 that's what she's going to say that what he did was become and make himself and allow himself to be a willing participant in bureaucratic mass murder. And even though that's not a crime in the Israeli code, it's something that deserves the death penalty. And we have to, in a sense, abandon the legalistic, formulaic, um, positive law and be willing at times to make judgments that go beyond the law in the name of justice. And so she's going to expand and rethink her nature of justice at the end of the book. We'll get there. That's in the, that's in the very end of the book. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now. I'm just putting it out there to show you that she's, this is going to get more complicated. Um, okay. Just w one more thing. Do, how does she overcome the desire for the, for revenge or does she? Oh, uh, that's, well, you're 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 getting to it because what she's going to say is that in the end, the reason we kill Eichmann is revenge. Wow. Okay. Um. But. But not. I mean, I, I feel like we're we're doing a lot ahead of the game. Um. But she's going to argue that there. That revenge is unjust, unless it can be brought back within the legal system. And. Um, and she's going to make an argument about how that happens in this case or could happen in this case. And that's going to be her argument about justice. So, yeah, um, uh, that's where we're headed. But okay. it's your, every question you've asked has been right on. So uh, I appreciate it. And I hope you keep reading and, and join us and you'll and you'll see where it goes. Thank you, Roger. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Stephen. You got to unmute. Yeah. Hey, Roger. Hi, Stephen. 
So this is my first reading of the of the book. Um, Hannah, I think, articulated a, a lot of the stuff that I was picking up on, and and the contempt at the uh, for Ben Gurion, and that side of the the, the chapter. I mean, I, I I read the chapter, and my, my comments because I'm new to this book are just on this chapter and its place in the book because it's the very first chapter. She's setting the stage. Um, for this to play out. And I'm wondering why she would have such contempt for Ben-Gurion. So I looked in the chapter to, to see where that might be. And, and I, I referenced this quote on, on a, page 11. And if I may read it, if Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, to all practical purposes, to the head, the head of the, the Jewish state, meant to strengthen this kind of Jewish consciousness, in quotes, he was ill-advised. So we have this kind of tension between the 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 the, 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 um, the case should be about justice, that she highlights at the beginning, only in a few paragraphs, by the way. And then the rest of the chapter is about this Ben Gurion um, narrative. Um, so she she goes on for a change in this mentality, this Jewish mentality is actually one of the indispensable prerequisites for Israel's Israeli statehood, which by definition has made of the Jews a people among peoples, a nation among nations, a state among states, depending now on a plurality which no longer permits the age old and unfortunately religiously anchored dichotomy of Jews and Gentiles. Now, I think this is really important in as much as it conflicts with her definition of anti-Semitism in some ways in the Origins book, and also on in chapter nine of that book, The Decline of the Nation State. So I appreciated Hannah's comments with regard to, to it. And then your follow-up, where you say that, yes, she, she, she was a Zionist and that she wanted to see a state of Israel, but not a nation state. And I think that that she spends so much time in this first important chapter of basically putting Ben Gurion and the prosecutor on trial themselves. So this the the chapter to, uh, brought the way I read it was almost as if the trial was on trial, and I I, I also would question the she your thematic that she tries to understand him, but why isn't that talked about more in this chapter? Why why isn't Eichmann more of the more center to this chapter? So I'll leave it there and, and look look forward to hearing your comments on the next step. So there's there's a lot in there. So thanks, Stephen. Um first of all, I mean, why isn't Eichmann more central? Well, it's going to be. I mean, the first chapter is basically laying out the ground saying that Eichmann disappeared from the trial. Uh she she at one point says that he became like a ghost or a pale ghost, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, and that because Ben Gurion and and Hausner, in a sense, um, were had so many other goals, he wasn't. You know, it, it wasn't. He just he just disappeared. And if you, um, and, and so she says, our goal is to bring him back. And then the next chapter is called the accused, and it begins with the rest of the book, which is really all on Eichmann. Right, uh, and it's an attempt to understand Eichmann personally, and then his role in the final solution. Um, you know, you said something uh, about putting the trial on trial. Um, what I would say is is it's a little more nuanced than that. She thinks uh, there were two different trials. Right, there was. The trial by the judge, the judges, including um, Moshe Landau, and there was the um, trial uh, that was done by um, uh, Hausner. And she thinks that the trial led by the judges was an attempt to do justice and was a, a, a legitimate, not legitimate, yeah, legitimate and, and, and respectable trial, whereas the trial um, that um, Hausner... Uh, tried to um uh to to put forward was 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 illegitimate um and and so 
I, I think she she judges the tr- you know she thinks that in the end Landau was able to keep it together, but she thinks Hausner really um uh, made it hard for her for 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 him to do so. Roger, um, can I respond to that? Yeah, because because it dawned on me while I was reading the chapter that it's unfortunate that the ICJ didn't exist at this time because it does seem that Eichmann is a proxy for for Germany collectively. And that the argument that Ben Gurion and the prosecutor are making would be perfect for the ICG, ICJ because that's state against state. And I think that that's I, I find there's merit in the in the case that Ben Gurion's trying to put forward. And, and I you know and I'm I'm just wondering um, why Arendt didn't see that. Well, I mean that's Deborah Lipstadt's argument as well, right? Which is that. Um, this was not just a trial to convict Adolf Eichmann of crimes. It was a trial to show the world what happened, right? Um, and, you know, RN says, okay, yes, you're right. That's what we call a show trial. It's a trial that sh- an attempt to show people what happened and not actually address the question of whether Eichmann was guilty or not. And on one level, you know, we all know Eichmann was guilty. And so does it really matter, right? Did we really have to go through this whole trial? And, you know, one argument is no. I mean, the trial was sort of a an unnecessary, um, you know, charade. Uh, we could have just killed Eichmann and gotten it over with because we knew he was guilty. Um, and uh, we're doing the trial not to do justice, but to use Eichmann for other goals, educational and 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 ethical and rn's view is well that's not what trials that's not we shouldn't we shouldn't allow the legal trial process to be hijacked for non-legal and political ends right um I, I point out that that's I, I agree with that position. That's actually the Ugandan judge in the recent ICJ uh, ruling, um, Judge uh, uh, Julia uh, Sebutinda said that she she dissented on all the six resolutions. Why? Because she didn't think the court should be politicized. And, and I'm in agreement with you. But I will say that the Eichmann trial what was a political tool to build a nation state, but there's validity in that. Well, I mean, that's, again, that is, that is the position of people like Deborah Lipstadt. And I think it's a, it's a legitimate position. Um, RN uh, takes a much more traditional or conventional position. Uh, You know, we're, we're about to, if the former president is reelected and he tries to politicize the justice department and the um, FBI and the CIA, um, you're going to see uh um uh you're going to you're going to see um efforts to politicize our the very basic um uh legal backbone of the United States and its faith in the rule of law which has been from the beginning now uh we can it hasn't always worked out we can we can talk about the the, the problems of it but rn's view is, and this is a view she writes in, this, this is a point she makes in the book that she published the same year, 1963, on revolution. She says that one of the great reasons uh, for the success, at least the initial success of the American Revolution in founding freedom was that we came to worship the Constitution and the lawfulness of, uh, of American life. And she really does believe uh, that a, 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 a keeping the law um, uh, uh, outside of politics, holding to an idea of the law as an institution of aspirational um, impartiality and legality that's geared towards justice and not politics is the last defense against totalitarianism. Uh, you know, she she's she writes about the number of German lawyers. Uh, I think 
thousands of them who also served during the Nazi time and during the Nazi time enforced Nazi laws. Um, she thinks that's 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 just a disaster. But uh, this is for her an important point that um, we need to hold on to the aspiration of the old Aristotelian line, line of, a, of, of a government of law and not of men. And, um, and uh, Arendt is, is, is going to stick to that. Um, the, the, the part you read on page 11 about Ben Gurion, um, it's a little confusing, uh, uh, but my reading of it is slightly different than yours. And so I thought I'd at least um, uh, read it again and, and, and bring out where the difference lies. And to do that, um, you need to start a little further back this is part of a long paragraph that begins on page 10. Right. And, and in this paragraph, um, the target of Arendt's ire uh, is the thesis of eternal anti-Semitism. Now, right. if you read with me um, chapter one of the origins of totalitarianism about three or four months ago or five months ago, whenever it was, um, you'll recall that Arendt believes that uh, the thesis of, of eternal anti-Semitism is one of the uh, fallacies um, that needs to be uh, overcome in order to better understand anti-Semitism. And the problem with eternal anti-Semitism is that if you accept that there is this eternal anti-Semitism, then um, no one is really guilty for doing what they're doing because what they're doing is just part of uh, something that's part of like the history of the world and can't be avoided. It's just always going to be there, anti-Semitism. And and so she says on, on page 10, right, that not only has their conviction, this is about four lines from the bottom, not only has their conviction of the eternal and ubiquitous nature of anti-Semitism been the most potent ideological factor in the Zionist movement since the Dreyfus affair, it was also the cause of the otherwise inexplicable readiness of the German Jewish community to negotiate with Nazi authorities. And she says, because they believe that there was always going to be an anti-Semitism, they could negotiate with the Nazis because they're just part, you know, they're, they're, they're part of the world. You can't blame them and you can use them to get what you want, namely a Jewish state. Um, and she's critical of this. So when you read, um, if prime minister Ben Gurion to all practical purposes, the head of the Jewish state meant to strengthen this kind of Jewish consciousness, that's what I take her to be saying to strengthen eternal anti-Semitism. He was ill-advised. For a change in this mentality, namely of eternal anti-Semitism, is actually one of the indispensable prerequisites for Israeli statehood. If you want to defend Israeli statehood, you need to abandon eternal anti-Semitism because you now have to see that the Jews in achieving a state are a people among peoples. And you can't just see it as the Jews against the Gentiles. There's now a plurality of peoples. The Jews are one of them. And if you're going to enter into the comedy of peoples, the comedy of, of peoples in, in international law as one of the peoples, you can't see it just as us against the Gentiles. You have to change your Jewish consciousness. And I think that's what she's saying in, in that in that paragraph. Right. Um, the eternal the, the point about the eternal uh, anti-Semitism, that wasn't lost on me. Um, but I believe that the eternal anti-Semitism does go through these stages, goes through these, I wouldn't call it an ev evolution because that would suggest maybe a telios. But um, um, but I, I would say that it's a different kind of, as it's evolved or as, as it's progressed, um, uh, I, I know her point. I think I, I don't fully agree with it in the first book, but I think that this is why people, you know, uh, have taken her comments to be controversial because there is, I wouldn't call it uh, eternal anti-Semitism, but there is a very long history of anti-Semitism that's morphed over the ages and has been uh, particular to the eras in which it's emerged. Right now, we're seeing a very overt anti-Semitism, what didn't exist before October 7th. 
right? So it's a different kind of anti-Semitism, but it is all anti-Semitism. So I, I, I take your point on board, but I, I still don't see, uh, I, I see the value of Ben Gurion's narrative that he wants to get out. He wants to raise that consciousness. And I do think he succeeded in doing that because this trial was broadcast to, to the rest of the world. Um, and you've made mention of how it raised everyone's uh, consciousness with regard to the murders among us, uh, all these people within society that need to be held accountable that weren't being held accountable. And so again, I, I make reference to the, the advent of the ICJ and its importance of being able to maybe prosecute these, these, uh, uh, these cases on the state, on the state level. And I, I take on board what you're saying with regard to the attack on the American legal system. I think we do have to be careful because we also see it with the ICJ right now. I don't know if you're aware that the new president of the ICJ is a Lebanese uh, judge. He said anti-Israel comments in the past, and he's now going to be uh, a pivotal figure within the, um, the South Africans case going forward. Um, Nawaf Salam. So I, I think, I think I know the corrupt the corruption of the court is 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 one of the themes of this uh, of, of of this book. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why this first chapter is focused on that question of how to keep the court focused on justice and not on politics. Um, you know, and uh, for many people, there was an injustice in RN's demand to focus just on justice because they thought that the um, trial was had a bigger purpose. Right. That's. That's Ben Gurion's argument, and it's you know the argument of someone like Deborah Lipstadt, who you know is a very smart reader of this book, and says, "Look, there's more to justice than justice." And um, you know, I I think Arendt simply Arendt and Deborah Lipstadt simply disagree. George, uh, yeah. thank you. Yep, I'm gonna come. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come back to Earth and uh, go back to the first page again. And uh, before that, I want to just speak a little bit about the history of my anti-rent bias in certain instances. Uh, again, I read this page, oh, a long time ago. And then again, it reminded me again when I read it this time. Uh, again, I have a background here that uh, I guess I get, need to go into. I'm a, I'm a refugee. I'm a, I'm a child survivor in Poland, and I got here in 1946, and uh, I grew up among many other survivors who were very open with me. There was, you know, I was like one of them, so I heard everything they had to say about their experiences. And one of the things that over the years is uh, none of the ones I knew took her very seriously. And... Uh, the reason was, again, like that first chapter, they would say, oh, you know, she's a yucca. That's what yuccas do. You know, they write like that, and which which was not quite fair. But Just, just so everybody knows, a yucca is a sort of a derogatory term for a, a German uh, German Jew. Right. Uh, and not necessarily derogatory, but uh, of a certain type. Uh, then the other thing, and I, I remember again when reading We Refugees, and somebody, whether it was my mother or whatever, saying, oh, Nebish, uh, look, there's she and there's Adorno and there's Eric Fromm and there's Hockheimer, all those poor people who so suffered uh, so much as refugees. So, you know, we played the uh, we're, <laughs> we're tougher survivors than you are card. But again, we shouldn't go there. But that that's my... Uh, standing there but the other thing is really the two things and and i don't want to go on too long because i know other people want to speak is two aspects of the philosophy here is number one the banality of evil uh is evil ba uh, banal or is evil uh um uh radical and there's a third po possibility that was brought up by a polish i think by gombrovich of uh uh of evil, uh, of uh, mimetic evil. And as with Gregory says that people doesn't kill because of their conscience tells them it's okay to do it. People kill because others kill. 
When they see others kill, they kill. So he's talking about a general aspect of humanity that we don't really talk about too much in this kind of session. We talk about who's at fault, who's not at fault. And finally, the, the thing that really, I mean, you said something that she was defending the uh, uh, the Jewish councils and the Jewish police and all that, which sort of surprised me. Uh, she wasn't quite defending them. And then the other thing about this whole thing about this whole thing about she telling these things. I mean, who didn't know this out of our, you know, anybody who reads Ringenbaum's diary, the ghetto diaries, or or Borowski or Levy, Primo Levy even, knows that Jews did not behave well. We did not behave well. I remember honor courts during my childhood. And so the, the, this was no big deal except for people who hadn't been through the Holocaust. And I'll stop there. I'm not sure what on page one you were actually referring me to, but um, maybe, I mean, but I don't know. I was referring you to the general tone. Remember, I think uh, it was Gershom Solem who who uh, who uh, complained about her tone, and it came to us as, oh, well, it's one German Jew complaining about another German Jew, and neither of them were there during the Holocaust. Yeah, no, I think I think that's, that's my bias. That's that's, I, I, well, I that's a biased statement. That's something we'll have to come to as we read this book and, and keep in mind a lot of, you know, there are there are different reasons that this book ended up being controversial. One is the banality of evil thesis. Right. Um, uh, which we have begun to talk about and we'll talk more about mostly near the end of the book where she only mentions it on the last page of the book. Um, a second is that, uh, as George just referenced, at one point in the book, she's going to be um, uh, critical of um, some of the activities of Jewish leaders uh, who ran some of these Jewish councils and of um, some of the Jewish uh, capos or people in the camps who um, uh, got special privileges for, for helping to organize the camps. And, um, and, and people... Some people were very upset at her willingness to criticize um, Jews, uh, you know, who made these decisions in very difficult situations. And we'll talk more about that when we get to those. And then a, a, I think a third, and in my mind, probably the most real reason that people are upset about this book is the one George just mentioned, which is the tone. Um, there's a kind of distant irony that um Arendt clearly embraces and uses to in a sense deal with the fact that she just found Eichmann utterly repellent and how do you write about this man who she found so repellent and she takes a kind of laughing irony to it whereas instead of a moral you know um condemnation and I think a lot of people found that to be um uh wrong and problematic and when she's accused of that by Sholem and others she says look you're right but then you're just attacking me as a person I'm someone who that's how I deal with stuff like this I'm ironic and I can't change that um so um these are things we will have to these are the three these are three different um complaints about the book criticism of the book that have been made and we'll keep an eye on them as we read the book and you'll have to make your own judgments about out them as you read it uh, Gilbert. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, first of all, please receive my deepest greetings from into my heart. And ours to you, Gilbert. You're most welcome. Then the second point, before I ask my question, I would like to address my deepest uh, gratitude and appreciation to Ben Gorio who took back Jewish people to, towards the promised land. Now, let me go to the point, to my question. In the chat, there is a, an interesting statement saying 
evil deed requires evil mind. Please, could you elaborate it on it? Because on my behalf, the way I understood, I, I just understood this statement, it sounds like you can solve a problem by applying violence. Okay. Um, so Gilbert, thank you. yes, thank you. So I, I, this is just, I mean, you're, 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 you're hearing me cause you know, some of you know this and some of you don't, but my, my, my academic background is as a lawyer, as a, as a law school, I, I have a PhD in law and a JD. So you're, you're, you're at, you're getting me as a lawyer here. Um, uh, you know, and it, and I used to teach criminal law in a law school. So, you know, I'm, you're just getting that. Um, and in criminal law, um, the idea is that our criminal law is morally founded, right? Um, and that um, we don't punish, we, we, you know, why should we punish people who break the law? And what the, 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 the sort of philosophical foundations of Western criminal law say is we punish them because the reason they broke the law is their pride, right? The first sin. And their pride elevates them above the law and says, I have the ability to break the law because I know it's the law, but I'm, I, my, I, I, I have the right to do it because I think it's right in this case to break the law. And that's the hard heart, right? That I have this prideful heart. And what legal punishment under jurisprudential theory says is, we don't just punish people and make them feel pain, which is what punishment is. Punish, punishment is pain. It's from the Latin poena, pain. Um, for the hell of it, we punish them and make them feel pain so that we break their will, their ill, their bad will, and bring them back to the law. Um, uh, and, and so um, the idea is that if they didn't have a bad will, if they didn't intend to do something wrong, we can't bring them back to it because they never left it, then we don't punish them. We may need to isolate them or we may need to deter them, but we don't punish them. And and so that's the 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 basic um uh, idea of 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 the sort of moral foundation of criminal law that we only uh punish people who not only do wrong but actually intended to do wrong because we then have to turn them back. Their sin is their pride and we have to break their pride and turn them back to the law. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilbert. Adolfo. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for that, Roger. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. It's been a while. For sure. For sure. Thank you. It's been hard to, to make it to the meeting, but I'm back. So, um, so it's just, uh, Two part, uh, two questions. The first one is: um, Are we reading Hannah Arendt well if we're only thinking about how Hannah Arendt's thoughts pertain to Jewish lives? And part of that is: uh, Is Hannah Arendt only writing Eichmann in Jerusalem to pertain solely to Jewish lives? And the second one that I was going to ask is. Jerusalem has meant so many things to so many different people. And it seems to be that, like, I, I think maybe I'm overreading it. Too. There's something to be said about a judgment in Jerusalem, a place where, like, judgments have been made for so long. And it's like, are we also supposed to here settle with Hannah Arendt's definition of Jerusalem, which may not be everyone's definition of Jerusalem, what Jerusalem means? I think you're on mute, Roger. Sorry. Sorry, there's so much noise here. I've been trying to keep myself muted during your questions. Um, great question, Adolfo. And, um, you know, I love how you ask it. You know, is Hannah Arendt to be read um, as mostly concerning the Jews? Um, 
There's no simple answer to that. Uh, on the one hand, let's just remember, if you're attacked as a Jew, she says, defend yourself as a Jew. There's no doubt um, uh, she has a certain pride that you can sense in this book in the state of Israel and in the fact that Israel is trying out of like she resists calls from people like um uh um Carl Jaspers her 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 mentor teacher and one of her closest friends to um extradite Eichmann to to to, to Germany or to have an international court there, there is a way in which she thinks it's important for the Jewish people to um try Eichmann and and she doesn't run away from that. And I think it's an important um, uh, distinction. She'll talk a lot about that in the in the final chapter before the epilogue. Um, uh, that said, this book is about much more than Jews, right? I mean, this conversation that I've been having with um, a number of you today about justice, Max asked this question earlier about justice and a couple other people have picked up on it. For her, justice is not a Jewish concern for Jewish lives. Hannah Arendt is saying in this book, we will lose something essential in Western civilization if we lose the aspiration for justice. And if we, for other reasons, some of which are good, right, as Stephen and others have put out, follow Ben-Gurion and say, you know what? There are times when politics should allow us to move beyond justice for good reasons, to help educate new generations, to educate the world, to help form an Israeli consciousness. Those are all good reasons for political things. But if we corrupt justice in that way, we risk the very foundations of Western civilization. One of the big questions that's going to come up in the last chapters, the last two chapters of the book is... Eichmann is accused of both crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. And Aaron is going to say he only should have been accused of crimes against humanity. And he's going, so she's going to resist the particularization at that point because she thinks Jews are part of humanity. And she thinks that to separate him out is actually to separate Jews away from humanity. Um, but, uh, you know, so what I would say is that the, the big issues in this book go beyond concern for Jews that said, you can't understand her tone and her experience in writing this book without understanding that she is someone who was arrested in 1933, had to flee Germany, was in a camp in Gurs. Uh, escaped the camp and made it here and um, understands that uh, Jews were being attacked as Jews and in such a situation, Jews better be willing to defend themselves as Jews. Um, Adolfo, is that, does that answer your question? I don't know if that was where you were headed, but I'm trying. Yeah, that, that answers my question. That sounds, yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, Bernie. Hello, everyone. Um, I I wanted this la uh, Adolfo's last question and your response, you know, kind of, kind of helped set the stage for the short comment I'd like to make. Um, I this is my first time reading the book. My knowledge of Arendt has come primarily primarily from one secondary source. Uh, I wonder if anybody else is familiar with Susan Nyman's book, 
uh, evil in modern thought. Uh, in that book, she has a you know reasonably large chunk of the book uh, dedicated to Hannah Arendt. Uh, I was familiar with the phrase banality of evil, but didn't really understand it until I read her uh, uh, exposition on what Arendt was talking about. You know, I'm not Jewish, and so I'm not coming at this from the perspective of what Arendt was or wasn't saying about Jews and Israel, etc. I'm interested in, I think, this universal lens of insight uh, into the human condition that draws me to wanting to, you know, when I, it was just a few days ago, I got the email that this virtual reading group was going to happen. And I thought, well, this will be the perfect opportunity for me to read the primary source uh, in a group. So thank you for organizing that. And I'm looking forward to it in that sense. Uh, Roger, uh, like you, uh, I have a background in the law, uh, 17 years as an environmental litigator, uh, sometimes on the bad of on the side of bad corporate evil, but I've had a long career re representing uh, radical environmentalists when they let, buried themselves in roads, et cetera. But then I abandoned all that and have switched to become an in, environmental sociologist and a sociologist of religion, trying to get at the core of what is it about the human animal uh, that as an organism needs a viable planet to live on and yet is rushing hell bent into destroying the only home possible of sustaining us. And I think that Hannah Arendt's uh, idea of the banality of evil uh, actually helps us elucidate that. Uh, and I, it continues to be surprising to me to learn that this idea of the banality of evil is controversial, that somehow or another she said something shocking uh by pointing out this common human trait um but anyway so that that for maybe there are others in this group like me that are interested in the universal application of this concept that Hannah Arendt helped us uh help bring into to the light absolutely Bernie and I want to thank you for bringing us to a great way to end the the session today um uh, the banality of evil, you know, even though it's only mentioned on the last page, but then the epilogue and the postscript are obviously deeply uh, um, consumed with trying to think it through. And and what you'll see is that Arendt, um, you know, admits that she's changed her views on evil a couple times and and really does think about it. And Susan Nyman is a, a great uh, guide to, to some of these questions, as you rightly said. Um so uh, we will, you know, Hannah Arendt writes uh, in 1958, the book, The Human Condition, um, or Vita Activa in German. Um, and, uh, you know, the evil, this book uh, written in 1963 is very much about trying to think through evil as part of the human condition and its place in it. And so uh, as we read the book, that will become a guiding light of of, of our of our reading and conversation. So. I look forward to that and look forward to your reading with us. Thanks very much. Uh, we're at the end of our time today. Uh, thank you all for being here. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. We we take, I believe, a week off next week because we have a conference at Bard on, interestingly enough, um, uh, the Supreme Court and the place of legal authority in Arendt's work between power and authority. So we have a two-day conference on Thursday and Friday. If you're near the Hudson Valley. We'd love you to come up and join us on Thursday and Friday. Otherwise, um, we'll be back in two weeks. Um, uh, enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and see you soon. Thanks very much. Gracias, Professor Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie.